and then they eventually made it to New York and then my father joined the Air Force and he like did all this amazing stuff for US intelligence where he had multiple passwords, passports and, and code names and like my father lived this crazy life. And if you talked to him, his stories were so boring. It's unreal. Like they were so boring and you would have to tease out all of the interesting things. And you were like, it was on, Rand talks about it. He goes, he was the most, he's either the most interesting, boring person I've ever met or the most Wait, most interesting, boring person or the most boring, interesting person, <laughs> right? Like we couldn't. And so that to me, I was like, all right, you can't just have a good story. You need to tell it well. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network. Uh, I am Dan. I'm your host. I'm so glad that you're joining me today. In this episode, uh, I had the absolute pleasure of chatting with Geraldine De Reuter. Geraldine is an, uh, an acclaimed author. She's a world-renowned public speaker. She is the voice behind the award-winning Everywhereist blog, uh, Everywhere, I-S-T, blog. Uh, she's also huge on social media. Um, her presence on Twitter is you have to follow it. And as we're kicking off uh, the season four of social media, follow, social media storytellers, that's why she's with me. Uh, now, besides travel, Geraldine also writes about uh, dessert, feminism, uh, Jeff Goldblum's entire filmography, she says. Uh, Time Magazine described her work as con consistently clever. And the New York Times said her writing was dark and hilarious. Uh, now, this is my favorite part about her bio, though. Her blog has received accolades from The Independent, from Forbes Magazine, Huffington Post, because as she says, sometimes feature editors get drunk. So <laughs> that gives you a little bit of a, a picture to her humor for you. Uh, when she's not on the road with her long suffering and infinitely patient husband, Rand Fishkin, who by the way was a guest from season three, go listen to his, uh, Geraldine can be found in Seattle, usually fighting with people on the internet. So uh, as I said, besides her blog, Geraldine uses social media for some amazing storytelling. Uh, I love her passion on anything from equal rights to food re to the food replacement Soylent, which we talk about in this episode. So you have to uh, hear that kind of part of the conversation. As we get into the conversation, please remember to visit thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, how to contact me, and for other resources to help you tell your story better. Now, let's get to the stories. <music> Thank you so much uh, for taking the time today, Geraldine, as I said earlier, uh, even though you're still in your, you know, your pajamas, so it's all right. Don't tell. Oh, don't tell everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said that. <laughs> Welcome to the Storytellers Network, Geraldine. I appreciate you having you here, man. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here and talk. Excellent. Uh, so <clears throat> I want to start. So this is the launch of season four, Social Media Storytellers. You're, mm -hmm. you're the first episode that's coming out here. And, and I, I still want to start where I always do. Um, with uh, talking about geography because two reasons actually for you. Number one, <clears throat> you're the everywhereist, so who knows where you are, <laughs> but also just because, you know, part of your story is that you lost your, your job so you could travel with your husband. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you can tell a story from anywhere in the world and you often do, but where are you right now? I'm at home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't too exciting or interesting, but I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm in my home office, um, which is a mess, but fortunately the camera angle doesn't show what a mess it is. That's so. right. We're hiding, we're hiding the mess, but it's an artistic <laughs> angle. So that's good. I love it. Um, so, but, but see, I, I'm outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan, which means I'm in a small town. So to me, Seattle is exciting. So it's <laughs> cool to have you there. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, but yeah, you've been kind of, I mean, obviously the everywhere is makes light of everywhere but you've traveled quite a bit and you tell stories from all over the place do you have a favorite place that you've told a story from that was just kind of interesting that like where you've written or something 
I mean, it's funny because usually the places that are <laughs> my favorite stories don't always come from my favorite places, if that makes sense. So usually the favorite stories are the ones that something unexpected happens or something terrible happens. And uh, as it's happening, you're like, okay, this is going to be a great story, but I'm not having a fun time right now. Um, and so it it creates a complicated relationship with the place. It doesn't ever become a, oh, I love this city because, you know, this great thing happened. That's never really that interesting of a story. Uh, so in terms of like favorite stories, I love, um, I love the Amalfi Coast for that reason. Uh, and I also generally like the Amalfi Coast. And if you're not familiar, that's, that's on the coast of Italy. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. Like it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it's just these, you know, cliff sides where there's little Italian villages, um, and then it shoots down into the water. And it is picturesque. And like, if you if you Google a photo of it, you're like, this doesn't look real. Um, and when we were in Amalfi, we were driving, and it was you know absolute chaos because the roads are incredibly narrow like it, it looks like a one lane road and then you have tour buses coming down it in like heading straight towards you and there are tour buses going in both directions and when they need to pass each other uh they they literally have to pull their windows in and they start inching past each other and it's probably there's probably an inch of space between them if that and you see the they're like, like the drivers looking knowingly at each other as they inch like they're just at a crawl and then when they get past each other everyone on the buses applauds so it's <laughs> it's this crazy wonderful thing but it's also an incredibly stressful place to drive um, and I recounted, you know, I won't tell the story here because it's kind of a long one, but if you want to visit my blog, it's under, I think it's under the best of tab. I have a story about driving the Amalfi Coast with my husband um, and it's, it's harrowing. So it's not quite my favorite. It's, it's a beautiful place. It's not quite my favorite place, but it's one of my favorite stories. That's funny. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I like the idea of clapping afterwards. That sounds exciting, yeah. but I don't want to go through it. <laughs> right. Well, and it's, I mean, like, you know, not to, not to change tone into the tragic, but, you know, it's so narrow that, that one of, uh, I think it might've been five or six years ago, uh, a tour bus went over the edge and it was mm. filled with people. So it's, oh, it, and, and everyone passed, everyone died. Right. Mm. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a harrowing and, and, and frightening place. Um, but it also makes for some great stories. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so you're, so you're a great storyteller. You have, you have oh, me thank you. <laughs> so enraptured in that. Um, where does that begin for you? Where does your story as a storyteller kind of begin? Gosh, I mean, it's, it's something that I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in my family are storytellers. My family's, you know, a bunch of first generation immigrants uh, and they all came over here and they're always talking and they were always recounting uh, stories and it's always kind of this competition to to tell a story correctly and and they'll start fighting over the details of it um, so I think it's very much ingrained in my family it's what you do you tell stories um, and my father was the most frustrating storyteller in the world uh, and I think that that has that has led to a lot of you know, that is, that has informed who I am as a storyteller. My dad was a profoundly interesting person who had uh, just remarkable, remarkable experiences. He was, um, he was born in Kirovograd, which is near Kiev, uh, in January of, I think, 1937. Or 30, yeah, 1937. Um, and he was born premature, so he, it was freezing cold. He was this tiny little baby. He managed to survive um, and then basically grew up as a kid during World War II. He and his brother were supposed to get sent to the gulags. On the day they were supposed to get sent with their mother, uh, the, Russian, the, the Nazis took Kiev. The Russian soldiers fled. My grandmother managed to get them across Europe during World War II. Uh, she finally got them to to Germany uh, where they ended up in a displaced persons camp. So my father remembers like Nazis and, um, and the story of how my 
uh, grandmother met my step grandfather was this remarkably romantic thing where uh, he had driven, he had gotten drunk. He was this kind of like, you know, like uh, very dashing, irresponsible character. And he was drunk and he was driving a truck and he drove it straight into a, a, a German radio tower. And the Nazis uh, were like, this is, this is, uh, this is treason, this is sabotage. And so they rounded up a bunch of people in the DP camp and one of them was my grandmother and they're like, we're going to start shooting. Uh, we're going to start shooting people until someone confesses. We're going to shoot one person like every minute or something like that. Um, and my, my step-grandfather kind of crawls out of the, the broken truck and he's like, oh no, it's not treason, it was, it was me. And he was Dutch and because the Dutch were considered kind of the, the uh, part of the superior race, they couldn't do anything to him. And they were like, no, no, it, it's treason. He goes, no, 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 it wasn't treason. It was me, drunk, driving, drove into the radio tower. That was me. I'm, that was me. And, uh, and the Nazis were like, well, we can't do anything to this guy because he's a drunk idiot. Um, and he's also part of you know, the Aryan race. So they wandered off um, and he walked up to my grandmother and she just kind of, because she was just standing there, and he looked at her, and she was like, so you're the great savior then. Um, and he refused to leave uh, until she kind of agreed. I don't know how. I don't know how you ask someone out when they're in a displaced person's camp. But like I said, he was like, he was like the superior race, so he was able to do whatever he wanted. And I'm, if people can't see, I'm using air quotes around superior race. Like I'm not <laughs> biologically related to this man, and my family was in a DP camp, so I just want to be clear. <laughs> um, but he had to get permission because she was considered an inferior race, right? Because she was, and so he, but he was madly in love with her, um, and they got married, and then he he died during the war. Um, he drove over a landmine and died. Uh, so it was incredibly tragic. She had been widowed. She was widowed twice before she was 30, I want to say. Um, it really broke my, like, broke my father's heart. Uh, and then they eventually made it to New York. And then my father joined the Air Force. And he, like, did all this amazing stuff for U.S. intelligence where he had multiple passwords, passports and, and code names. And, like, my father lived this crazy life. And if you talked to him, his stories were so boring. It's unreal. Like they were so boring and you would have to tease out all of the interesting things. And you were like, it was on, it, Rand talks about it. He goes, he was the most, he's either the most interesting, boring person I've ever met or the most, wait, most interesting, boring person or the most boring, interesting person, <laughs> right? Like we couldn't. And so that to me, I was like, all right, you can't just have a good story. You need to tell it well. <laughs> That's what I learned. Um, incredible. Yeah. So sorry. That was a very long no. answer. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. That was, man, I'm just like, I feel like I'm in a movie right now, just watching all this happen. <laughs> now, so, so you, you are, one of my favorite things about you, Geraldine, is how passionate you are about things like activism and social media is, is, is how you are as a as a woman in America and in, in this time related to your grandmother because it sounds like she was bold to be able yeah. to say that to the, him and then a widower twice before she was thirty like that takes strength. Yeah, I never knew her. Oh, okay. I never knew her, so um, I've never thought about it. I never thought about it. Um, it does. I will say it does make you feel like. When I hear the things that both of my grandmothers, my Italian grandmother and my uh, Ukrainian Russian grandmother, when I hear about um, the thing, and I say that as a as a hyphen, I, I understand Ukraine not is not part of Russia, <laughs> but she, I think she was ethnically both. Um, but I think when I look at what they went through, and I'm like, I type on my laptop, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it definitely, I'm like, yeah, a bit of a keyboard warrior so it does kind of make me feel like I'm not doing you know not doing as much uh, but but it is it is fascinating to see what other people you know what they went through and it does put things in perspective and like they still even all the garbage that they went through they still had a lot of privilege on their side mm -hmm. you know they were smart they were able-bodied white women they they were able to do a lot because of that so 
And do you think that that's the power of story? You know, you, you joked about keyboard warrior, but truly, I mean, the, the power of the pen is greater than the sword, right? So, however that exactly goes, but like, but, but story can be so important. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see power in that, whether it's in social media or whether it's your writing or whether it's video? Oh, absolutely. I think it's where, I think it's where empathy comes from is, is when you tell a story and it resonates with someone, right? That's absolutely. And, and how do you live that out? So, so I want to, I want to start here. I mentioned st um, social media, your, the, the things that you're passionate about, not, mm -hmm. not just travel, but travel included. How do you live that out? Is it purposeful or is it something that's kind of in you as a, I'm guessing Gen X, as long as myself, the yeah. social media is part of who we are, right? Yeah. Is it purposeful or is it just kind of natural for you to use social media in that way as a storyteller? Um, I don't think it was inherently natural. I think it became that, you know, when I look back at when um, you identified me as a Gen Xer, nobody ever gets that. Um, I'm very really? excited. Yeah, yeah. Nobody ever gets that. They're like, shut up, millennial. I'm like, thank you, but also no, wrong. <laughs> um, Same thing here. Yeah. yeah. I, I, live, I mean, I have the gray going on in my goatee and stuff, but live my life like a millennial for the most part, work from home. Love, yeah. Love it, like, but yeah, Gen X, man, come on. But it's, but, but it's arbitrary. It's super arbitrary, it but it I hold on to that title just because Gen X sounds so cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, I totally forgot the question. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's, I don't think it's inherent, or at least it wasn't, because I look at the early days in which I used social media, and I had no idea what I was doing at all. Um, it becomes this like, like, I'm literally like, this is what I had for lunch. This is what I did here. And I think it, I, I can actually see as, you know, as kind of the political climate changed and how other people were using social media and the people who I were following. Um, then I started to realize, oh, oh no, this is a powerful, this is a powerful kind of um, tool and, and people are using it in very different ways and, and we need to be mindful of that. And I need to also uh, be part of that conversation because if people are, you know, like, I, I think it started, you know, D-Ray McKesson, who I was following during, during Ferguson, he was basically like live tweeting the Ferguson protests and everything that was happening. Um, and it was, it was, it was a kind of a mind blowing thing. And, and it's like, well, you can't tweet, Hey, like the movie I saw was great. Like you can't, you can't, that can't be part of the conversation because it's so tone deaf. Um, so I think that's when it started to change for me. Gotcha. And it, so one of the things that I heard you say in there was that you learned that evolution was, was, was learned yes. um, by following people that inspired you. So as storytellers, is that yeah. how we get better is to, to up the game by following other people and using them as inspiration? I think so. Like the thing that I always, the thing that I always say, and my husband stole this from me and I think he might've said it on your podcast Uh oh. <laughs> and I'm pretty mad cause it's my line. All right. is, uh, you have to read, if you want to write well, you have to read well. Mm. And, um, and I think there's truth to that. And if you want to tell a good story, you have to follow good storytellers. Um, and it becomes, it just, starts to it, your inner you will find that your inner monologue starts working differently and that voice that wants to write starts just starts to starts to speak a little louder and the words come a little bit more easily when you when you read the work of of other great people and it's funny because we forget that for some reason if you look at if you look at any other craft you know if you look at if you look at at sports, if you look at at any other arts like like um, music or or painting, like everyone always studies the masters. You know, they will watch videos and they will scrutinize their work. I mean, I mean, Da Vinci did that, right? And for some reason, we think that writing and storytelling doesn't work the same way. We think it's not something that needs to be practiced. We think it's something that just comes out of you and just happens and like that's not true that you need to work at it I mean maybe somebody maybe somebody gets up and can do it like I don't know Jonathan Franzen or somebody is just like I don't know blah, and then beautiful stuff comes out but like no <laughs> not me it's like it's like working out you have to do it 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like working those muscles. I mean, exactly. Writing is yeah. a muscle. Yeah, I get that. Can you, can you tell a story only through social media? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, yeah, you can. It's a different, it's a different way of telling it. You know, it's funny. There was a, there was a New Yorker exercise where the, where a writer wrote uh, basically a sci-fi story and it was an excellent sci-fi story in, in tweets. And this was back when you can only have 140 characters and it was 140 characters at a time. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a really interesting stories. And then that's a very literal take of it, right? You can also tell stories through tweets. You can tell them through, through Instagram photos, but I, I think you have to understand that Excuse me, I'm burping because I literally just had breakfast, even though it's 11 a.m. <laughs> um, it's almost two here, so you know. Okay, wow. Things. Okay, I just, yeah. I just had lunch and I have some ginger ale, so. I okay, cool. Okay, cool. So I expect you to do the same thing. All right. But I also, I mean, I again, like, I'm, I'm kind of like of this generation where I'm like, but, but then it almost seems like it's not as real when you've done it via Twitter. I don't know. I, I kind of. I kind of like to own things on my own platform. Mm. And if you do it via social media, you can't do that. Um, and so that that's where things get, you know, that's where I kind of, where I'm kind of hesitant. And, and I found lately, like over the last, maybe let's say two years, mm-hmm. I've found social media to become this, this thing that we go to in main media, mass media, that they constantly go, who tweeted what? This is what Twitter said. This is what, whatever. And it's like, okay. time out a minute. When did that become the source? I love social media. And, and this season is all about social media. People on mm-hmm. social media that I admire who tell stories using that tool. Mm-hmm. And I think it's great. But I also, it's, I wonder like, where did that become where everything is? What happened to websites or other, just other sources? And so I don't know, it's, it, I don't have a question for that. I just kind of, I, I agree. It's, I like using social media, but I like having my own platform. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, social media is also, it's a little bit more broadcast focused, right? If I want to tell, if I want to get the story out there and I want to tell people like, here's where, like, here's what I wrote, here's where it is. I think it's a great tool for that. But you know, like I've, I've had a few posts go viral um, just in the last year and I, even from a very selfish perspective, like I want that traffic on my site because that correlates to certain uh, financial advantages for me, yeah. you know? So, um, so that, that, yeah, I, I want more ownership over that. Oh man, this is incredible. Uh, I'm, I'm all over the map on what I want to just ask you. I just want to like, I do that to people. I, I do that to people. If you have any structure, I just, I, I wish <laughs> I'm like, do I have a piece of paper I could tear up? I do. I do. I need this piece of paper so I can't tear this up. This is important. What is it? These are notes. These are notes about my next book. So I'm going to put those Ooh, down. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I need those apparently. <laughs> yes. Is that, so is that how, so let me ask that then. Is that how, you structure writing as taking little notes to plan for your next book or does it just kind like, of come like out a messy, like a blast? Out some messy scrap right. paper on right. a paper clip. Um, I, because I'm fascinated with how people do stories. I, me book, too. Like, me too. You You're not the only one. So I just yeah. talked to my friend. I'm, I think you should have her on the show. Her name's Andrea Dunlop. She's just written, she's written two books and a novella. And she just wrote her third book, which isn't out in print, but um, the cool part, the exceedingly cool part about being friends with novelists is you get to read their book about a year early. <laughs> so she just sent me her book and it's her most recent book and it's so good. And I'm not sure what the title is going to be yet. So I can't share that with you. And she'd probably get mad if I did anyway. <laughs> um, but I was talking to her because she writes these, I mean, they are these kind of epic sprawling sagas and sometimes they're family sagas and sometimes it's this like personal uh story of like just this heart-wrenching story she's really she yeah she's a really good writer um and I asked her I was like Andrea do you do you do an outline she goes no like what she goes I take notes 
but I don't do an outline. And I realized I can't outline either, um, which for nonfiction is really bad. But I think it's bad for fiction too. Like you're supposed to have these outlines on things and they always tell you that. And I don't. Um, I take, if I showed you, I have, oh gosh, I'm not going to show you because you can't see it now and, and the shame is huge. There are piles of paper behind me. Um, there's just an assortment of and they're they're pretty neat, but there's piles of paper, and some of them I I I have trouble throwing away because it's like a bunch of note cards and like a bunch of notebooks and then just random scraps of paper. And if you go through it, it is actually the original first draft of my first book. Gotcha. And I'm like, I'm like, I need to throw this out because I published the book. <laughs> But it's like, and I'm like, oh, this was, this was when I thought this chapter was going to be in there. This was when I thought that this joke worked, you know, and like, and so that's my process is that like, whenever it hits, you, you got to write it down. And so I just have, I have, I just have sheets of paper everywhere, <laughs> right? I don't even know what, does any of this make sense sometimes I think sometimes I write stuff and I'm like oh this was funny this was a good joke like I need to keep this like I wrote down um, something that my mother did and then I said this is how Batman villain villains are made and so um, I was like that's funny I'm keeping that I'm gonna use that but like like there is no there doesn't need to be structure or order to it and I think if you don't want there to be, but if you are a structured or ordered person, there should be. Um, so figure out what works for you. Boy, that was a real long answer. Yes. I am messing up your podcast. Not at all. Sorry. Oh I my want, God. I'm my, I'm my dad. I'm my dad. <laughs> oh no, God. You're, you're interesting and interesting. Not you want to do Oh ideas. God. No, no but I'm taking forever to make a point. Oh God. Oh God. We turn into our parents eventually. It's fine. Oh man, it. I already have the mustache. <laughs> oh, I can feel it. I can that's... feel it. I can feel the accent coming through. <laughs> Lower East Side, New York mixed with Russian. Did he ever anyway, lose that Russian side of it at all? Uh, so he sounded like he sounded like a Lower East Side New York Jew. Mm -hmm. Um but he could speak Russian without an accent, which is why he was a very good asset to the American intelligence services during, uh, during the Cold War. Interesting. Yeah, wow, so he did fascinating work. Yeah. Uh, so, Jill, then you, you contribute to major publications like Mashable, CNN, Oprah's website, for crying out loud. <laughs> how, how did that happen? Like, how did you get there? You, you know, what, what, I mean, what? <laughs> What is going on, right? So, um, so Mashable, CNN, uh, Oprah, they all contacted me and just did like, they, they either uh, did features on the site or they asked me about um, to contribute something. So that became very much a, that was very much a just writing and continuing to write and kind of putting my name out in this specific world. Um, and the way in which I realized I would, was going to do that was to differentiate because there's a lot of travel writers out there and I knew that I couldn't, when I started blogging, um, I knew that there were budget travelers and they were doing that really well. I knew that there were adventure travelers and they were doing that. There were people who were photographing uh, their trips and they were just amazing photographers. I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't compete on any of these levels. So what can I do? And I'm like, well, I'm reasonably entertaining, reasonably if you're drunk. <laughs> and I, um, and I can commit time because at the time I had, just a wealth of time. So I was like, all right, I can, I can blog every day, Monday to Friday, and I can put a new post up every day. So that became my goal for the first two years of writing. And I put a new blog post up every single day um, for two and a half years. And because of that, I just got just the wealth of, of the number of posts, like the sheer number you get about like by the, and people always ask, well, what do you have to do? And I'm like 500 blog posts, uh, basically, yeah. you know, put up five, 600 blog posts. Like, and once you hit a thousand, that's where like, you can't write a thousand posts and have, I mean, like, like posts that are pretty good. Like they don't all have to be winners, but they have to be pretty good. Um, <clears throat> don't, don't phone it in. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and if you do that, that's when, that's when, 
publications start to pay attention. And I'm like, that's crazy. I hear myself saying that. I'm like, geez, Christ, that involves a lot of time and a lot of energy. And, and so I think there's other ways to get there too. Uh, but that's what, that's what I had to do. Um, and then I occasionally would have a blog post go viral and then I would have publications contact me um, and say, hey, do you want to write for us? So I ended up writing an op-ed for the Washington Post. And the way that came about is they uh, they read my Mario Batali cinnamon roll piece that went yeah. viral at the <laughs> yes. beginning of the year. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the advice, I guess the roundabout advice that I always say is keep writing. That's how you do it. Do and, not stop. And and now that you've kind of, you've, you've made it in a sense, you're in those publications, you... Oh. you I don't feel like I've made it, but go on because yeah. this is well, fascinating. Can you, for can, my you just go, can you just go anywhere now and just be like, I'm Geraldine De Reuter. You can publish my article. Or do you, no, do you have to do it no, no, I still get rejected. I get rejected by people who've published me. Um, no, no, the rejection never ends, friends. So don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry if you think, oh, what if this rejection is just a temporary thing? It won't be. It won't be. It'll follow you. Um, and you will always <laughs> doubt yourself. So fear not. No, um, that's terrible and not inspirational at all. Um, but uh, no, I think, and what I find is some of the most remarkable writers I know are just filled with debilitating self-doubt. Mm -hmm. Just so much of it. I will be in a room of the most, um, I'll be in the, I will, I have sat across from, I have had coffee and dinner with, and I consider myself friends with some amazing writers, like, like women who I just have fangirled over. And then they will, you know, email me and they're like, Hey, your book was really cool. Or, you know, they're like, Oh my God, it's so cool to meet you. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? First of all, I'm very uncomfortable. And secondly, all of them are are like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. And I don't feel like I've made it. And I'm like, your book was a bestseller and I love it. And I'm like shaking it at you, you know? And like, and you're sitting there at their readings full of their adoring fans. And you just had, you know, you just hung out with them like a couple nights before. And they're like, I don't know you guys. <laughs> and so I realized like that never goes away. That never, maybe that, maybe that doesn't ever go away. And I don't, I don't know if it's just true for women. Maybe it's true for everyone, but it's true of a lot of women I know who are amazing. And it's good to know, it, it, you said it's not inspirational. I think it's a, inspirational in the sense that it, it's empathy. I, yeah. I hear that voice in my head constantly. Yeah. The, the imposter syndrome. There's no way like whatever yeah. that is, right? So yeah. yeah, it's good to know that we're not alone. And that even as someone who you, who I could look at who has again, made it in a sense, not that you're, you know, going to stop writing forever or whatever, but like somebody who's gotten to that point where you've been published in some amazing areas, you have your book, you have your blog, you like awesome stuff, right? You still have to work for it. You don't just get to sit back and go, Hey, I wrote, I wrote on a napkin, publish this. Yeah. You have to work. You, I mean, you have to write a book. Um, and like the thing that I always tell people is the difference between <clears throat> So I ask this every, almost every time I, I do a speaking gig, I always ask the audience, how many times, and I'm going to ask you now, how many times have you read a book and it's just been acclaimed and people love it? And you're like, that oh, was pretty good. Oh yeah. I've, and you're more like, more than once. Yeah. And you're like, I kind of feel like I could have done better. <laughs> right. And yeah. I think a lot of us, it's this weird duality that we all have where we're like, everything I do is garbage. This amazing thing that someone else produced is maybe that I think I could do better. <laughs> so we have that duality. And the thing that I have realized is the difference between someone who has written an amazing book and someone who hasn't is not necessarily talent because there are amazingly talented writers out there who have not written books. The difference is that they have finished the book. 
And that's the thing that I always tell people. I'm like, look, it doesn't need to be perfect. Like you in your head have the most perfect manuscript, right? Like you have the most perfect book in your head, but if you don't get it down, it does not matter. And this person who wrote this book that you think is maybe mediocre, but is getting incredibly well reviewed, like they finished the damn book. And that is what you need to do. So that's the difference. The difference is getting it done. That is the only difference between them and you right now. So that's what I tell people when they want to write. Now that's inspiring. I like that. Also, oh, thanks. also a bit of shaming. It's like same thing. I've got ideas. I can do this. And I have my, my full Why book. Why don't you do them? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why don't you do them? Yeah. Uh, Cause I'm lazy. No, you're not. <laughs> you're clearly not. <clears throat> You're not. You got a fancy podcast. That's right. So you're not. So. I can talk more than I can yeah, write. You ain't wearing you ain't wearing PJs till the middle of the day. So what's your excuse? <laughs> I'm also not wearing pants. I have shorts on, but I'm not wearing pants. Um well, <laughs> I can't that, see I can't see. You could be wearing pants. You could be wearing tuxedo pants for all I know. See, that's the beauty of the podcast mullet business. Oh yeah. Top. You just got to be fancy you know, up top. Right. I have like the I have the I have like the reverse mullet. I've got it shaped back yeah <laughs> which is probably why people think i'm a millennial but you know eh, you know eh, it's fine i'll let them uh, i love it um so i, I want to talk about one of your writing pieces that that, that blew me away N- not just because of the writing but because of the odd backlash that you got but also oh. the frankly the, the 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 i don't know what the word the chutzpah the gall to write it um your test of yeah, soil calling out the yiddish i you know right. it was either that or say the balls which i mean yeah. no i prefer I, I don't have those uh, but right. i prefer right. hutzpah. uh yes. the 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 bravery the everything that you did the, the t- test of soylent that you did oh god i mean first of all <laughs> crazy <laughs> oh it was so awful right it sounds so I, I awful can, I could taste it in your writing. It was. Oh, yeah. I can taste it too. Wow. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's yeah. Cool. Like what? So I just, I, I don't even know what to ask about it. What, what drove you to do that? First of all, I guess. Uh, so my friend, my friends, Ben and Chaz uh, drink, drink, like every, our developers of uh, Moz where my husband worked, um, the company that my husband founded and they would have just cases of it. And I was like, what is this? And they're like, oh no, it's great. It's perfect. We, we don't have to eat meals. And I was like, okay that's terrible um like then you're not selling me on this and they're like, and I'm like what's it taste like and they're like it's fine mm. it's like okay again not really selling me on this so I thought all right I'm gonna try this because it's touted as a meal replacement uh thing so I was like all right so Soylent I'm gonna try it and I thought I would try it twice a day every day for a week you know two times a day and then have a sensible dinner um so I, I tried half of one and I was almost instantly sick. I was like, okay, my body can't process soy icolate uh, protein, I think is what it was called. Oh. Um, and then the next day I was like, nope, you got to do this. And so I drank two Soylent and I was violently ill I was just doubled over in agony I was just I mean like not to get too graphic like I couldn't leave the bathroom I was like this is awful um so I wrote about that and um the Soylent like fanboys and I say fanboys because they were all men just came out of the woodwork um, and I had to block so many people from the comments because they were just getting abusive. And sometimes I block people because they're annoying and it's my blog and I can do that. And no, that is not a violation of free speech because I'm not the U S government and I can do whatever I damn well, please. Amen. Um, so sorry. Yeah, um, I'm with yeah, it. You don't get, you don't get to trash on my site cause it's my site. Just like mm-hmm. if you came into my house and started screaming, I would kick your ass out. Um, because that's not how free speech works. I can still tell you you're an asshole. Mm-hmm. So, oh, sorry. I don't know if I can cuss. Oh, you. you're fine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So that's basically what happened. And yeah, the, the backlash, I like, I get a backlash for weird stuff. Sometimes I expect it and sometimes I don't. Um, and so the Soylent one was, was a little surprising. Yeah. And, and I, and it was, it's funny because, not funny. It's, it's interesting to me because, <laughs> 
because I, I, I'm, I'm a guy. Uh, I'm yeah. in the I'm in the Midwest. I am yeah. white. I am privileged. I know where my station in life is. Yeah. And I've become I've come to realize this over the last few years, right? I'm as the as the millennials say, I'm woke. Um. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um. But I had no idea the backlash that you that women face that you women emp- empower with a voice face over the stupidest shit from men. Like guys, stop. And so it, it was. It was interesting for me in a lot of reasons. I mean, again, the, the chutzpah it took for you to talk about your, uh, your violently ill episodes. I was like, <laughs> wow, that's a lot of detail. Um, and and that one, respect, I will like- say, <laughs> oh, thanks. And I will say that one, not like, I would say the, the backlash wasn't that bad. The insults wasn't, weren't that bad. And the, the crap that I get online, it is not, it is a drop in the bucket compared to what uh, my friends get. Yeah. Like just nothing. Well, and I've, and I've seen, so I, I have, um, Laura Fitton, uh, pistachio, uh, yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on Twitter. Um, I've, I'm acquaintances with her through my connection with HubSpot and speaking there. And that kind of yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I consider her a friend and, uh, yeah. and I've seen that from her too. And she's talked to some of her friends and, and shared it. And I'm just, again, I'm thinking, why is it that, that we do that to each other as, you know, either as people in general, why do we do that? But also as genders, like why, why do guys have to do that kind of crap? And I just, I don't understand that side of our nature and I want more storytellers to have that freedom and that, that, that that, that it shouldn't take bravery to tell your story. You know, you should just be able to tell it Uh, anyway. No, I, I think that's a great point. And to your, to your question of like why this stuff happens, you know, the thing that I always say is like these, you know, the institution of sexism, like institutionalized racism, this stuff doesn't, just exist on its own like these things are very powerful and they're very entrenched and um and i'm sure somebody's like well i'm not a sexist i'm not a racist how can you say that those things and i'm like okay well our inability to want to confront this stuff um is part of that right like you know it's very hard to it's very hard to confront your own privilege. And, and part of that is because there's a bunch of, of institutions like that are, you know, part of, part of like kind of like the racist world in which we live in that say racism is an intentional thing. Sexism is an intentional thing. Uh, It doesn't happen on, it doesn't happen on accident. And therefore, if you do these things, like you are a sexist and a racist and you did it on purpose, And that sort of mentality means that nobody can identify their unconscious bias. And if you don't, if you're unable to identify your unconscious bias, even if you're like a very cool, very aware person, you're not going to do that exploration to kind of see those things in yourself and see how you help create that terrible structure. So I think part of it is, you know, when you say, why do we do these things to ourselves? It's because this stuff is really, really powerful. It's been in power for a very, very long time and it's designed to make sure that we don't question it. And when someone does question it, we attack them because we feel threatened. Like that's how this stuff works and it's scary and terrifying, but that's like, that's the truth of it. Right. So that's, I mean, that's like a very roundabout answer to your, to your question, but like, yeah, like like sexism and and racism have existed for all of humanity. Well, almost all of humanity Mm -hmm. for a reason, like they are tough institutions to combat. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the power of story can help combat that? I mean, Absolutely, but we need to a listen um, and b uh, you know make sure that all of those stories are are heard like are amplified. Um, you know, if you're listening but we're not amplifying the right stories, then that won't happen. Um, and so I always say like a lot of that falls to those of us who do have big microphones. Like we need to, you know, you need to if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, like you need to follow. Um, you need to follow people whose voices are not being heard and whose short stories are not being shared. Uh, and you need to do what you can to share those stories. And and speaking of of that idea, you know. It, as a social media person in, in this season, but also just in general, what, how do we combat the echo chamber of social media where people aren't doing that? You know, it's like for me, I want to follow and, and connect with people who don't necessarily look like me or mm-hmm. live where I live or believe what I believe. 
to sharpen me and understand mm-hmm. and have empathy. Is that, I mean, how, how do we even start that? Boy, um, it's a, a big problem. <laughs> it is a big problem. It is a big problem. Um, you know, and for me, it started, it started really slowly. Like I said, I think I started following D. Ray McKesson. Um, and then I started looking at who he followed. And then I started following those people. Um, and I think you just need to, uh, you need to start following voices who are prominent in, in different communities. And, and you, you sh- it should you should be able to find them without too much work, um, even if you're even if you're a white uh, cisgender um, heterosexual uh, able bodied uh, person you know living living in the Midwest like you should be able to find them, um, and the one thing I always like the one thing Rand always tells me is, you know when my when my knee jerk reaction is like I don't want to read that, he goes. Uh, you should probably analyze why. Um, and years ago, he sent me an article on like white privilege. This was years ago. And I was like, I'm not re- I don't want to read that. And he was like, no, you should read that. <laughs> and I was like, but I don't want to. And he was like, yeah, and you need to think about why you don't want to. And then you should read the article. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I read the article and it was so uncomfortable. Um, but that was important because I needed to get through that discomfort because that discomfort is like, is like all of these awful like structures that keep racism in place, right? Are making me uncomfortable um, because they're, they're telling me, you know, to, to ignore my unconscious bias. Um, and so I read, I read it and then, and then the wall kind of came down and I was like, okay, I need to start listening to other people's stories. And I think once that happens, like once that wall comes down, it becomes very, very easy. Um, and you, everyone can figure out how they want to do that for themselves. Like there's no right way um, to do that. And do you think for those of us who, who kind of feel like we are there, influence others just by talking to them about that stuff and, and kind of promoting that almost, almost like a, like a promotion of, you know, uh, uh, like, like I'm marketing that to others, right? I'm, I'm a marketer. I think about that, but is that, yeah. is that part of our responsibility then too? Do you think? I, I mean, I think, um, so I, I guess, I don't know if any of us are ever like, I don't want to, I hesitate to say, oh, we're there because it implies that we can rest on our laurels and stop working. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But like, um, like we, we're never there. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just, but I, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say that, yeah, I think if you are someone with a microphone, you kind of have an obligation to make sure that other stories are heard that aren't yours. You know, you need to share that platform. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, this has been more fun than you can imagine, my friend. Uh, Stop! Oh my gosh! I Thank you all. I've had. I feel like yeah. I feel like we're just. I feel like time has just flown by, and I've just realized I've taken up like an hour of your time, just I, like prattling. You could take up many more. Uh, this oh. has been a lot of fun. If I was, oh, if I was you. closer, you may have to uh, have a double date with my wife and me and, and Randy. Oh, this, this is a lot of fun. I love double um, dates. I do. Uh, I think if I make it to so Seattle, I'll let you know. Please do. Please do. I would uh, love that. But I, I want to wrap up with, with my last question, my big one. Yeah. This, this is my, my fun one. This is for me. Okay. Um, you're, you're a storyteller. But if you were yes. told that you could only tell one last story and be done telling stories specifically, what would that story be? Wow. Why do I want to cry? Um, (laughs) That is, um, I'm like so emotional by just that question. Wow. I could tell one last story. I think it would be the story about my first date with Rand which I've told before, but I think it would be that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've told that story so many times. Um, But yeah, the story of how I met my husband is one of my favorite ones. So it would probably be that, but I want to cheat. And I want to say that I would tell 
story of my relationship with my husband in real time or you know like and then like I have to keep telling it until that story ends so you know like but um yeah I think I would tell I think I would tell the story of my first date with Rand if I had one last story left to tell uh which is funny because I basically told it in the book <laughs> so um but I don't know for some reason that made me that made me super emotional. That made me so sad to think about. Glad wow. Would, yeah, I, I need to, I might need to reflect on that one. What's your answer? Do you have an answer to that? I, you know, it's funny because I've, after almost 40 interviews, I've heard everybody's different answers. Mm -hmm. I've heard so many good ways to say that and, and what that would be. One of my favorite was, the, the, um, I asked uh, Al Gettler uh, how, what his would be. And he said, it would be whatever happened yesterday. I was like, what do you mean? Like literally yesterday? He's like, no, whatever happened yesterday, because I'm always telling stories. So whatever happened yesterday impacted me in some way. I would tell that, whatever that was. Like, wow. wow. Um, or uh, I, uh, yeah, any, yeah, they've all been incredible. And so I think for wow. me, I think for me at this point, at this particular point, my answer would be, um, I would want to tell a story about what I've learned from talking to storytellers. I would want to take all of this information over 40 interviews or whatever mm -hmm. and share one story about that with people to inspire and change their lives mm -hmm. so that I could go out on a high note. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think for me, like so much of my life is around so much of my life centers around like this love story that I have with my husband, right? So much of it. Um, but if I only had one story left to tell, hmm. I just can't imagine that it would be anything but that one. Yeah. I love it. That, that's really, that's, that's powerful. And it shows me that it's okay to be a romantic. Yeah. I mean, I'm a very cynical romantic, so it works, right? Like I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I think I'm very realistic about it. I'm like, yeah. But um, what this reminds me of is uh, there's a Donna Tartt book and I can't remember the name of it, The Secret Society. Mm. But there's a line in it where he's telling a story and he says, um, he says something to the effect of, uh, I realized like this is the story I'm telling because basically I've looked at my life and I realized there's no other story left to tell. Mm. And I just thought that was such a powerful statement. I was like, wow. So yeah, yeah. that's a good one. I love it. Yeah, I like thank that you line. so much. Yeah. Now, thank where, you for having me. Where's the best place for people to find you? Um, I have been taking the month off of social media, which has been great for my mental um, <laughs> health. Uh, but normally you can find me on Twitter. Um, uh, be careful if you tweet at me because if you tweet anything like a little risque, Twitter will, will shadow, like block you from me seeing you. Um, because I guess I'm like a, I don't know, that's what it does to my account. Uh, I can be reached, if you go to my about page, my contact info is on my blog. Um, and uh, on my about page and my blog is www.everywhereist.com. So everywhere is, but you got to spell out all the word everywhere and then ist.com. Um, and those are probably the two best places to find me. And then you can email me via those, um, via that way. Um, my book, All Over the Place, Adventures in Travel, True Love, and Petty Theft, is available, I think, at most bookstores, um, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, if you want to go the, the evil, if you want to go the evil empire route, and, um, and you can order it. If your independent bookstore doesn't have it, you can order it from them, and they should be able to get it pretty easily. Excellent. We'll put those in the show notes, of course. Um, so yeah, so thank you again. This has been a lot of fun. Um, oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad you were able to do it. <laughs> thanks, thanks. All right, so once again, thank you so much to uh, my guest, Geraldine DeReuter. Thank you for taking the time to talk 
story with me. Uh, that was a lot of fun. You can uh, definitely follow her on Twitter. She will bring uh, a whole new perspective to your life. She will bring positivity and cynicism and some challenges and some great insight. Uh, she is a lot of fun on Twitter. Uh, you can find those links in the show notes. Uh, and hey, if you like what I'm doing here on the Storytellers Network, please consider leaving a review. Uh, go over to Apple Podcasts or if you want to call it iTunes, it's the same thing. Uh, go over there to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Hit that stars, the five star, whatever you want to do. And uh, and I actually read out a, a sentence or two. I really appreciate those. Uh, I do read them. Uh, for a while, I was reading them on the air. So maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll do that again. But I'm going to test something out. And we're not going to read them on the air. If you want to hear more reviews read, send me a note. I'll go back to doing it. So there you go. Uh, yeah, that's about it for Storytellers Network, Season 4, Episode 1. Tune in next week for another one. And uh, thanks so much for listening. And until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.